Coming up on this edition of The Climate Show, news that suggests Europe could be getting wetter due to a warming Atlantic. What else have we got, Gareth? We've got bits of ice uh, breaking off Antarctica, off the Thwaites Glacier. We've got southeastern Australia drying because of an expansion of the subtropical zones. We've got permafrost methane burping up and causing us problems. It's a whole world of worry we've got for you on this edition of The Climate Show. <laughs> You've really sold it there. Cybertooth tigers versus woolly mammoths as well. You've got to check out this episode. It's all coming up. This episode of The Climate Show is brought to you by hot-topic.co.nz cyblogs.co.nz skepticalscience.com scoop.co.nz and idealog.co.nz Hello and welcome along to The Climate Show, episode number 29, recording this 9th day of October 2012. My name is Glenn Williams, recording in London, United Kingdom. My co-host is Gareth Rinaldin in Waipara. Hey, hey Gareth, how are you doing? I'm very well, Glenn. Thank you very much. Here we are in the Southern Hemisphere, a full 12 hours ahead of you. So you're recording over breakfast and I'm recording over dinner. Indeed, and I have my cup of, cup of tea. You've got your glass of wine, and uh, well, this. And if I slur, if I slur at all, it's because of this very fine Spanish wine that I'm drinking at the moment. Lovely. I'm very, very jealous. Very jealous. I'll follow that up 12 hours later, I think. Um, <laughs> it's a show, this is a show, if you're just tuning in for the first time or um, returning after um, perhaps a few episodes, just to remind you, it's a show all about climate change, the policy, politics, the science, um, all the news kind of digested in a um, hopefully a, a bite-sized, e easily digestible um, chunk of video or, or audio. And of course, you can find all the bits and bobs, the links to everything Everything we're talking about, the uh, the audio and video streams are up at uh, theclimateshow.com, also hot-topic.co.nz, which just happens to be the home of Gareth Renaldin as well, where he covers off uh, much of the climate change news from New Zealand, but also around the world. And uh, today's another news special, isn't it, Gareth? We'll look at, um, at some of the uh, the top headlines over the past three, four weeks. Yes, absolutely. We're just still kind of getting the hang of doing this from opposite sides of the world. So there are, we, we're still sort of wrestling a little bit with um, technology and connection, but we hope to be back to the full versions of the climate show before too long. Hey, for, for, now, those, for those watching the, the video stream, what's that? Um, you've got like a, a camera posed behind you. I didn't notice that before we started the show. What's, <laughs> what's going on on with that? <laughs> Ah, no, that's because today I have been a photographer. Um, yeah, that's my, my camera on it. It's a Canon 5D, an old one. Right. Um, and I've been doing some uh, photography. So I've been taking actually mug shots of myself so that when I send a press release out to reviewers of the um, of my new book, The Aviator, yes, uh, copy, copies available, <laughs> available from <now>. Amazon <laughs> and all good internet retailers, uh, then, um, then so the reviewers can see who I am. Yeah. So I had a very careful shave this morning and I, my hair is looking terrible tonight, but... It looked a lot better when I took the photographs, I tell you. So I, anyway, I, I didn't get round to taking it off its tripod, so it's hanging around behind me in the, in the photos. Nice. It looks like a good, it's, a, it's a, a prop, anyway, for you there on the video. For those watching the video, for those listening to the audio, you don't really care, do you? So let's go on, get on into the news. <laughs> What's um, first up, Gareth? Well, I think, I think what I wanted to talk about, Glenn, was something that was of deep relevance to you. And we discussed it in our last sort of attempt at the climate show, um, which was that um, Britain's been having a run of wet summers. And uh, just in the interval between these two shows, a paper's been released. It was covered in The Guardian and the BBC. Um, at, uh, it was actually the, I imagine it was The Observer on Sunday um, and also on the BBC, that the uh, paper from um, uh, Rowan Sutton and Buen Dong in Britain, I think they're at Swindon University actually, have discovered that there's a relationship between a warm North Atlantic and wet summers for Britain and Northwest Europe. Now, that's um, 
not directly saying that there's a link to what's going on in the Arctic, although um, the, the BBC report uh, quotes Ms. Rowan Sutton as saying that uh, there's there's a possibility. It's a little bit early to uh, you know the, pa the the papers haven't been done. The work hasn't been done to confirm the analysis. But what they have discovered is that the a period um, of warming in the North Atlantic, which is associated with a phenomenon known as the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, which is a cycle roughly sort of 60 years long that um, you get a, a patch of warm water in the North Atlantic and then it goes cool and then it, it's warm again, um, affects, directly affects the, 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 the state of the summers in, in Northwestern Europe. So this paper shows that the, um, the, 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 where, if the North Atlantic is warm, it means wet summers for Britain. Now, the big question is, of course, we've got... Um, a situation where the North Atlantic is getting warmer and warmer and warmer anyway because of global warming. Mm. Um, does that mean that Britain's in for a, a long, a long-term run of uh, wet, wind, wet summers? Hopefully but, not. Well, well, indeed, uh, particularly if you happen to live in Britain. Uh, <laughs> but the um, what uh, Sutton says is that he believes that the work that he's done will allow them to pick up whether the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation is, is changing phases and whether that will mean a, a flip in, in weather patterns. And it could happen in, in as little as a year or two. So it's a, a very interesting thing that confirms the, the link between warm water in a particular part of the North Atlantic and wet summers in Britain. And the big question now, which will be resolved, I guess, as people look more into the state of the atmosphere over the last five years, is whether that has um, been exacerbated by the changes that are going on in the Arctic. And there, yeah. there are certainly suggestions that that's the case. Well, and of course, all those things linked as well, right? Because um, if the Atlantic is warm, that's causing the, the, the ice to melt and therefore compounding the problem. Yes. Um, the, the thing is that they measure the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation by what they call detrending the data. They take out of the data any particular trend. And the steady trend that's going on is warming. Hmm. And so it's an open question. Uh, what is that warming doing to the state of the multi-decadal oscillation and what does that mean for the overall state of the atmosphere? Mm. Because what's further north is very dramatic. And at the moment, the, we've passed the minimum. We talked about that last time. We passed the sea ice minimum. And so gradually up there, the ocean, which has been getting warmer over summer and which has melted the ice, is now cooling. And in order to cool and get to the point of of the sea ice reforming, it has to lose heat to the atmosphere and to space. And so an awful, an awful lot of heat that never used to happen, you know, if you go back only 10 years, the amount of refreeze at this time of year was a fraction of what it is now. And so it's going into the atmosphere and it is beginning to um, change the patterns as they flow around the, the, northern, the northern hemisphere. So, I guess is something where we see cold snaps happening early on in the in the winter in the northern hemisphere or is there going to be um, a cold snap later on hmm. or you know, it, it, it's very interesting if i were you glenn i would have brought my ugg boots she <laughs> i've got my, i've got my boots i got my boots um hopefully um this is going to be proved wrong for next summer because i've also just got my ticket to, to the glastonbury festival as well um was one of the one of the lucky ones managed to refresh their browser enough times on uh, Sunday morning in order to get a ticket. But yeah, June next year, let's pray for a um, a dry beginning to the summer. All right, so uh, let's move on to um, this article here from Skeptical Science this time, um, talking about the uh, the mounting of the permafrost and um, what that will mean for uh, this uh, feedback loop that we've talked about in previous shows, Gareth. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the um, methane is the kind of big unknown. Um, we know there's an awful lot of stuff in the permafrost, a lot of carbon in the permafrost and under the seabeds um, in, in the Arctic regions. And the quantity of carbon that's down there under the seabed and in the permafrost is sufficient to add 
at least as much again carbon as we've already put into the atmosphere so its potential for causing extra warming is is huge frankly and it's the big positive feedback that has a lot of people seriously worried because if we uh, if the warming that we've already put in train through our emissions causes this permafrost to melt causes the carbon to be released to the atmosphere at a fast enough rate then it has the potential to make anything we do to cut emissions uh, more or less meaningless mm. so what this mcdougall it al paper which has been analyzed and explained very carefully at skeptical science um john cook's uh, wonderful operation um it's what they were saying is that the thawing permafrost will release carbon to the atmosphere and it will have an appreciable additional effect on climate change, adding at least a quarter of a degree Celsius by the end of the century, and possibly as much as one degree Celsius um, over that um, sort of 80, 90 years. Um, now, the temperature effect of, the, of the, that, fee, that, that feedback is not sensitive to whether we cut emissions or not. In other words, it's something we're, we're probably already committed to. It doesn't really matter what we do. That's going to have to be added in. And it, 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 in the absence of any um, future human emissions, if we could somehow cut our emissions off, the permafrost thing is going to be self-sustaining and it will um, cancel out any natural carbon sinks in the oceans or through tree growths and in the biosphere over the next two centuries. Um, what the sceptical science piece goes on to say is that there are several reasons for considering that even this particular outlook, which suggests that the um, methane is going to be a, 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 a bad positive feedback, mm. they may be wearing rose-tinted uh, spectacles. It could be even worse than that because it doesn't look, for instance, at the seabed methane. It doesn't look at the um, additional warming that we're already you know, baked into um, where we are through our, through our carbon releases. Which... Um yeah, you got to think um, will influence policymakers, won't it? This, this, the, these types of stories because they'll say, well, phew, you know, we're stuffed anyway now, aren't we? Look at this, look at these feedback loops coming in. So, heck, let, let's just burn the rest of it. Glenn, that's that's probably the most worrying thing of all because I don't have any sense that the people who are making policy have following this science in any way at all. I mean, the, we've just been through a record Arctic sea ice minimum, and we have in the US a presidential election where both candidates um, seem to be dead set on not talking about climate change. Mm. And you look in the New Zealand or the UK situation, um, but it, politicians in both countries. In fact, in, in the UK, I guess the, the David Cameron's trying to degreen his government. And we've got over here in New Zealand a government which thinks that, you know, expanding our drilling for oil and our coal and so on is the way to guarantee economic growth for the future. So I don't think there's any politician in the world, frankly, who is really taking this stuff seriously. Because if they were taking it seriously, the, the, the information that we're getting on methane, on the changes in the Northern Hemisphere climate, you know, that's the sort of information that really ought to be making us pa panic, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Which, which also, um, you know, relating this to the American election uh, shows how out of touch um, both parties are with the electorate because there was this interesting story coming out of uh, ChinaDaily.com.cn saying that undecided US voters, uh, the swing voters, the very important swing voters, I mean, it seems to be the swing voters that actually decide the American um, election, the outcome, they actually support some type of climate change action, but they're not hearing any kind of climate change talk. Um, apart from, I think there was a cursory sort of um, uh, mention from Obama. He said um, that it's not a hoax, um, and that's all that's been said. Of course, Romney hasn't said a, a, a thing, um, not, the, not that I'm aware of it at all. So, um, so if they were to uh, come out with, uh, you know, and, and, and perhaps one of these um, televised debates um, of one of the candidates was to attack the other on their climate change policy or at least present some kind of solution, then, um, you know, it could be a, a winning uh, topic for them. 
Oh, potentially, yes. And I think there's a lot of people in the US who would love climate change to be um, a deciding factor in the election. I mean, I think it's interesting, for instance, that <laughs> the link you choose to refer to comes from China yeah. Daily. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I, I suspect that a, a large chunk of the US media is not covering this topic at all and if it's not making headlines in the US then the politicians there probably feel they don't need to pay any attention to it yeah and I do think that you know the, the, the media has a responsibility in 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 shaping the nature of the political discourse and that sounds terribly pretentious but um, I think that's the case and it's it comes back to something I've said many times and that is that I've got a nurse feeling that we're not going to do anything really substantial about climate change and by that I mean doing more than Kyoto by you know actually having governments enact legislation that really seriously reduces our carbon emissions mm. until there's some sort of climate event that makes it completely impossible for them to ignore it mm. I would have hoped that you know 2007 and then 2012 Arctic sea ice reductions might have been that sort of event, but apparently not. No, no. We, we, I think I remember we talked about that in, in a another show. I think with one of our guests. You know, what would be the event? What would be the thing? That would tip it over, um, and and that was discussed as one of the possibilities: um, uh, melting yeah. Arctic ice, icebergs. You know, the uh, headlines around the world, and it was headlines, but no. Nope. It's just yesterday's news already. I know, it's terrible. And, you know, the worst thing about it, Glenn, is, that, and it's something that I, I, I find myself talking about more and more or writing about more and more, and that is that um, terrible thing called the climate commitment. And that's the period that it takes the climate system to catch up to the warming effect of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So we're at something, you know, a tad under 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide at the moment. And it's going to take the planet something like 30 years to warm up. Mm. To w <laughs> Did you hear my wife in the uh, background? A say, spe oh. special guest star on today's <laughs> show. <laughs> it's going to take the world something like 30 years to warm up. Um, to reach equilibrium to that that level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Yeah. And that means that where we are today guarantees warming for 30 years to come. Hmm. So for the Arctic sea ice, that means that it's guaranteed to be, I, I reckon, ice-free in summer. Um, absolutely guaranteed. There's nothing we can do to stop it. And at some point, if if, if we wait until... There's a climate disaster that you can't deny or you can't evade. At that point, there will be 30 years of worst climate disasters to come. Mm. And, and that's the strategic um, message that our leaders, our political leaders, are completely failing to come to terms with. They just don't understand. This is not a problem that you can sort of brush under the carpet and leave to the next president or the next prime minister or the next mm. apparatchik that comes along. This is something where we actually need to work together now to stop it being really seriously bad in the future. I feel like you're lecturing me, Gareth. You're lecturing <laughs> me. And you're lecturing me about this climate change business, and I don't believe in it because this next story, you know, we were told that um, the oceans would rise, uh, islands in the Pacific would be inundated, but this next story says that the uh, global mean sea level dropped by five mi millimetres in 2011. So there you go. What's this, what's this climate change hoax? That's, no, I just I put this in as a story because I thought it was absolutely fascinating. I, we did talk about it um, uh, in an earlier show, and that was that the extent of the flooding rains that hit Queensland in, in Australia and um, the Amazon Basin, um, north, sort of northern South America, uh, was so huge over the, El, the La Nina of 2009-10 sorry, from the, in, in the La Nina of 2010-11, was so strong that sea level actually fell. So much water was evaporating over the sea and falling as really seriously intense rain over land that sea level fell. And That's astounding, 
<laughs> that, 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 you know, that is amazing piece of news. I, had, you know, that so much water could be evaporated that the ocean yeah. would fall. I, I just, the mind boggles on that one. Well, you know, that's I mean, one of the most robust um, predictions of climate uh, climate models is that intense rainfall is going to get more intense. And it's observed. We can see that. It, it doesn't matter more or less where you look in the world. You can see that intense rainfall events have been getting more intense. And part of the reason for that is that... Um, warmer oceans close to land put more water vapour into the air. The atmosphere moves that wet air over the land, rain falls. So you get intense rainfall. If you get the right conditions, you'll get flooding and you'll get an awful lot of water onto the land. Mm. What's staggering about this, and it's a paper by Carmen Burning and Josh Willis. Josh Willis, very well known as one of the leading kind of sea level researchers uh, in, the, in climate science circles, um, they show that the sea level drop in 2011 was caused by that water exchange between ocean and land. And it was the flip from El Nino conditions in 2009-10 to the strong La Nina of 2010-11 that drove that change. Now, we're in the position where we're coming out of an El Nino, we've got sort of weak, um, sorry, we're coming out of a La Nina, we've got weak El Nino conditions at the moment. Yeah. Uh, it's not clear that it's going to be a strong El Nino. It could be um, a weak one. It could intensify a little over the Northern Hemisphere winter and then die away. Not clear what's going to happen to that at the moment. But it'll be very interesting to see if that brings um, a flip in the, you know, change in where the, the flooding rains go, because that's what El Nino, La Nina does, is it shifts the circulation of um, hot and dry areas and warm and wet areas around the world, moves it all around a bit. So it'd be fascinating to watch to see if that happens again. Mm. Okay, well, talking about um, you know, moving hot areas and, and wet areas around, so some research uh, that has been published in Nature uh, suggests that the Southern Hemisphere may be becoming drier in places. Yeah, it's not a great headline, that, because what they're actually talking about is a decline in April-May rainfall over southeastern Australia. And what they, the researchers have discovered is that there's been a southward expansion of the subtropical dry zone. Now, what that means is that um, the way the atmosphere works is that at the equator, uh, lots of heat arrives from the sun, causes the air to rise, goes up high and then it cools and it falls and where it falls you get the basically the desert areas north and south of the equator so in africa for instance north of the equator you get the sahara desert south of the equator you get the kalahari in australia what they've discovered is that the southern boundaries of that dry zone have been pushing south and so the Rainfall reduction that they've measured in southeastern Australia over the last um, 30 or 40 years has been uh, equivalent to the, 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 um, the zone 400 kilometres further north moving southwards. So it's as if the southern boundary of that overturning Hadley cell circulation has moved 400 kilometres south. Um, now that's only in the April-May period, which is the autumn period in um, the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, it's not clear that the same thing is happening in South Africa, mm. and it possibly isn't happening in South America. But it is very interesting because one of the firmer predictions from climate models is that the, the, that subtropical dry zone is going to expand as the climate warms. And it's a simple consequence of more energy going in at the equator, creating a stronger overturning circulation. And so that subtropical cell expands north and south of the equator, and the desert areas move further and further south. And in terms of, say, New Zealand, it's a bit like somebody dragging both islands closer to the equator, so that huh. the top of the North Island might just know, in time, move into a dry zone, much drier zone than it's currently in. Um, in Europe, the equivalent would be with um, southern Spain, which uh, this summer, for instance, has been a very dramatically hot, dry, and lots of lots of bushfires and so on in, in Spain this year. And that's akin to the northern edge of the Sahara Desert moving further north and into mainland Europe. So... 
very interesting this paper yes well worth having and, and, and the, uh, the conversation uh, website, the conversation.edu.au, also um, looks at this paper as well and talks about um, you know, the fact that there will be regions type of you know, wet and dry regions existing in Australia and ecosystems um, existing in Australia in the future that currently don't exist there at the moment. And of course, you know, this is going to have an effect on um, farming in, in the southern areas of Australia and, um, and crops, I'd imagine, as well. Absolutely. I mean, the one thing about farming is that farmers, if they know what's happening, if they if they if they know what's coming, then um, in theory, at least they can adapt. Now, if they've got enough water, um, then they can irrigate if it's getting drier. If they know what's happening in terms of heat, then they can adjust the crops. Um, they can they can sort of adapt their farming systems to the climate as it changes. That isn't a luxury that ecosystems have. Mm. All the ecosystems can do is kind of move with with the changes in climate. And when you think about the, I mean, there have been dramatic climate changes in the past. The, the shift of the Earth into and out of ice ages over the last three million years has been really, really dramatic. You're talking about changes in global temperature of up to five degrees Celsius in, um, you know, 10 to 15,000 years. But... We're looking at changes of the order of the, of the same order of magnitude, two, three, four degrees Celsius, happening in a hundred years. Mm. So ten to a hundred times faster than the fastest climate change any of the ecosystems that are around today have experienced in the last three million years, and it that's going to mean radical change. Indeed. Well, um, this is The Climate Show. My name's Glenn Williams and uh, my co-host Gareth Renaldin there. Uh, we've just got a couple of stories to go and um, I feel that we've been ignoring uh, a, a very important part of uh, the world, an important part of the climate system uh, over the past um, couple of shows or so because uh, the, the, uh, the Arctic's been getting all the attention. But what about the Antarctic? What's been going on there, Gareth? Well, it's been winter. <laughs> so it's been cold and uh, usually the Antarctic in winter is not a terribly newsworthy place, not not least because there aren't very many people there. Um, we can occasionally have a look down from a satellite and see that, uh, you know, temperatures might be 10 degrees above normal. But when normal is minus 70, um, that's not a difference that anybody's going to really notice. Um, but no, uh, Yesterday morning in my um, RSS feeds up popped a post from Maury Pelto, who's a glaciologist in North America who works a lot in the glaciers of, North, of the northwestern um, USA. And his blog, From a Glacier's Perspective, covered a major carving event on the Thwaites Glacier, the Thwaites Glacier Tongue, um, which is a, a, a major glacier in the western West Antarctic, uh, very closely, uh, very close to the Pine Island Glacier, which is a major area of uh, investigation at the moment in West Antarctica. The Thwaites and the Pine Island Glaciers are often thought of as being uh, the weak underbelly of the West Antarctic ice sheet because the 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 way that the, the the land is shaped underneath them, the warming oceans that are causing these um, glaciers to thin can actually spread a long way underneath the ice sheet and potentially at least um, cause a rapid loss of ice. Mm. And we've been seeing and measuring um, considerable increases in the rate of ice loss from these glaciers. And what Maury's found is by looking at satellite pictures over the, over the winter, that there's been a major carving event from the Thwaites Glacier Tongue. Now, a glacier tongue is where the ice is moving out from a glacier and it sticks out into the sea if you like and eventually it gets long and bits fall off right and in the normal course of events that wouldn't be something to worry about because you know there's a sort of cycle going on here moisture evaporates from the ocean moves over the land falls as snow turns to ice feeds the core of the glacier it's like a very slowed down water cycle because it just has to go through ice on the way and move ice down towards the sea eventually the ice pushes down to the sea breaks off melts bang and the cycle repeats itself but what we've been measuring in, in Thwaites and, and Pine Island is that the ice has been thinning and speeding up and so whilst an individual iceberg breaking off 
uh, is not necessarily a sign of anything dramatic. Mm. It's a normal sort of event. What's interesting is that these normal sorts of events appear to be happening more frequently mm. and are associated with um, thinning and they're happening in an area of the West Antarctic, which is an area of intense study, because when you look back at interglacial periods, um, the last interglacial, the Eemian interglacial about 125,000 years ago, sea levels were about six metres higher than they are today. And we know that at least some of that water came from Greenland, and some of that water must have come from West Antarctica. And so there's a major question of, over which bits of West Antarctica are the most vulnerable. Um, what are the prospects for, for West Antarctic ice over the next century or two? Um, is there the potential for rapid, and I mean really rapid, decadal um, scales of ice loss in that area? And yeah, it's an area to what? It's interesting. We've got all this analysis coming out in winter. Exactly. Is there um, are there any predictions out there at the moment for what we can expect over the Antarctica summer? You know, will we expect anything dramatic like what we've seen in the in the Arctic at all? No, I, I think that's very unlikely. To be honest, um, I think there'll be a lot of interesting science done, and there'll be interesting papers done as a result of that science. People will be, you know, ha hacking over the ice will be shipped into Thwaites and Pine Island to take lots of measurements. But the fact is that Antarctica is warming uh, less rapidly than the, the North Pole, and that's because it's a large, high, cold continent surrounded by a big ring of ocean currents. And those ocean currents around Antarctica tend to uh, insulate or isolate the main part of the continent mm. from the water going on. So there's quite strong warming in the currents around Antarctica, but that isn't translating itself into you know, large amounts of warming over the main body of the continent. That, Having said that, the Antarctic Peninsula, which is the bit that sticks up towards South America, that is one of the fastest warming places in the planet. And that's where we've seen ice shelves like the Larsen B and so on um, disappear over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. And we can ex whether we see another major um, ice shelf loss this summer, it's possible, but I wouldn't be betting on it. Um, in terms of what happens to the ice over the next year, I mean, all eyes are going to be on the Arctic. Mm -hmm. uh, 2013 summer, I mean, we've been watching the Arctic both interested amateurs like me and um, scientists, glaciologists, uh, sea ice scientists and so on have been watching it with intense interest over the last um, decade. There will be even more eyes focused on the north next year. Mm, indeed. Well, one thing um, that you shouldn't find in Antarctica, um, it would be highly unusual and b bizarre if you did, would be a woolly mammoth carcass, Gareth. And I thought um, this this would be a good one to finish on. Um, a woolly mammoth carcass was found in Siberia in the melted or melting permafrost. Um, I thought this was interesting because... You know, I mean, it's got to be fascinating to find a woolly mammoth carcass. Um, the, the young boy that was walking his dog at the time, he certainly came across something pretty amazing. But, you know, it seems to be one of those stories, you know, that, that would be part of a piece of a puzzle of things that are happening, permafrost melting, you know, stuff that's been locked up for so long. Uh, yeah, and, and in those regions is now becoming available. Of course, we've talked about the oil and gas that is now becoming available. Um, but there's these little little stories that are going to pop up, I think, and this is kind of one of those, um, you know, those signs that you know you don't people don't necessarily draw the dots and go, oh, this is related to directly related to climate change, but it could be part of one of those pieces of the puzzle, as I say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the interesting thing about these mammoth finds is that they, they, they tend to sort of stick out of riverbanks that are eroding. Mm. And the reason riverbanks are eroding is because they're melting, because yeah. the permafrost is melting. Exactly. And so, um, as this boy did, you walk along and you see a bone sticking out of a cliff. And, well, lo and behold, it turns out to be an extremely well-preserved mammoth. I mean, it has to be said, this is not new. People have been finding well-preserved mammoth, frozen mammoth skeletons um, for the last couple of centuries. And there is a 
thriving market in the ivory from mammoth tusks. Wow. Uh, <laughs> because you know there's, there, there are strict controls over ivory generally, um, because people don't want to shoot elephants. So um, mammoth ivory has has got quite considerable value as well. But you are right; it is a kind of bellwether of what's happening up there. Um, I'm not sure we can necessarily use mammoths as a proxy no. for uh, warming in warming in Siberia, but. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess maybe, it's... I guess maybe because I've, I've, I've been reading your book and I've, I've almost, almost finished, and it seems to be one of those stories that you might, um, you know, include there as, in sort of in passing, as the airship goes over Siberia, a mention of uh, all the woolly mammoth carcasses and that trade in ivory from those carcasses that, that's been going on. I'm sure that you know we're going to see more of this. We're going to see more. Um, you know, dinosaurs and really fascinating, interesting, you know, saber-toothed tigers. Weren't they up in that region as well? Uh, I'm not sure about saber-toothed I tigers. Saber I... Tiger was, uh, it was somewhere. <laughs> we'll have to have a biologist on the show. Actually, I thought, no, difficult I, questions. I'm probably, I'm probably wrong, and I should just do a quick, quick Google search, but I thought saber-toothed tigers, um, uh, you know, we're, we're taking, taking out woolly mammoths. Oh, well, maybe they were. Maybe they were. But I, I, I haven't heard of saber-toothed tigers being found in the permafrost in Siberia, hmm. whereas woolly mammoths are found quite a lot. Saber, well, and the Google search comes up with saber-toothed tiger versus mammoth. <laughs> <laughs> there must be a YouTube. There must be. <laughs> um, I've got something here. Um, what's this going to be? It's Spinosaurus versus woolly mammoth versus saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> I don't know what this is. I think, Glenn, we can probably safely leave that to um, yeah. another <laughs> Actually, yeah, actually, th th there's, a, f there's um, a picture that I've seen before, for those watching the live uh, video stream. Yeah, a, um, a saber-toothed tiger trying to take out a woolly mammoth. Absolutely. Very dramatic picture. Hmm. I don't know what that proves. If nothing at all. Nothing. There's nothing scientific in that at all. If you were a saber-toothed tiger and you had fangs like that, you would want something substantial to sink them into, wouldn't you? Indeed, exactly. Hey, well, that, um, that wraps up uh, this show, Gareth. Uh, episode number 29, creeping towards the, the big three zero. Yeah, and we will be hopefully uh, resuming our normal format before too long. Mm. Uh, we're getting on top of our... Uh, sort of technological issues and our time zone shifts and everything else. So uh, I'm hoping that we can introduce John Cook back into the mix with the next show. Hello, John, if you're listening. Indeed. Uh, we don't run away because we'll get you back on again. Yes, and, and, and it's a good time to thank um, Skeptical Science as one of our partners um, for helping distribute the show, um, as well as Idealog and um, Cyblogs and uh, Live News. Uh, .co.nz um, also help us distribute that through Scoop, which is all good. Absolutely. In their new offices. Scoop have their new offices. Oh, do now, they? So. Oh. Yeah, they do indeed. They do indeed. There's no posters on the wall yet, according to the pictures I saw anyway. Very cool. And of course, um, you can get this show in a couple of flavours, whether it be audio or video. And all the links to everything we've been talking about will be up at theclimateshow.com and hot-topic.co.nz. And don't forget, um, in the audio side of things, you can get it on your smartphone through the smartphone app Stitcher, uh, Stitcher which is available on iOS, Android, um, and some of the other devices as well. And we're in the environment section, science and science and technology environment section. You'll find us up there or just do a wee search within the app. And that's just an easy way of getting it um, you know, mobile, plugging it into your car or uh, if you're like me at the moment on the tube from one side of London to the other, you can get through a couple of good shows. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And yeah, basically wherever you listen or watch, you'll find us. And that's not a threat, it's a promise. <laughs> Indeed. GlennWilliams.co.uk is my website. hot topicconz for Gareth. Twitter.com forward slash The Climate Show. And don't forget to check out the uh, Facebook page as well, which we're updating quite often now, more often than not, with um, you know, new, interesting climate news stories. And um, we'll also be posting the show up there. So uh, check Absolutely. that out. Absolutely, 
And remember that we, we're actually working in two shifts here because when I'm asleep, Glenn's awake and vice versa. Yeah. So you, you can't escape the climate show these days. We're a 24-hour news channel. <laughs> We've got the world covered. Gareth, thanks very much. <laughs> nice, to, um, nice to see you on this uh, London, very chilly London morning and your New Zealand evening as you warm up, um, heading into uh, more spring-like conditions there. We'll catch you next Absolutely. time. He's hoping that spring has arrived by the time we do this next show, Glenn. Indeed. See you later. Cheers. Bye-bye.